Thank you, everyone, for coming. Oh, and we are recording now, so I want to thank you and welcome you all. Uh, you are joining our AARP New Hampshire sponsored program with the Creative Feast. And my name is Kathy Howie. I'm your host today. I am also a volunteer at AARP New Hampshire. Today's event is, a, is part of a series with the Creative Feast, which we have every month, focusing on food and its impact on healthy living. And today's program will feature winter soups, comfort in a bowl. AARP has been promoting the health and well being of older adults for over 60 years. Here in New Hampshire, we strive to bring you informative, innovative, and fun virtual events like today's online cook along demonstration as a means of connection and inclusion. AARP has also a number numerous free healthy living resources on its well on its website from staying fit to wellness and longevity, information on healthy eating as well as staying sharp. There's something for everyone and Francis will put the the link in the chat www.aarp.org/healthyliving. If you have any questions or comments during the session about AARP New Hampshire or the cooking demonstration, please put them in the chat and my fellow volunteer, Francis, will raise them with Liz. Our cooking uh, instructor today is Chef Liz uh, of Hollis, New Hampshire, who built her cooking career in a, in a variety of Boston catering and restaurant venues. She has a large following of loyal students, especially today, and, and who are enjoying her recipes and teaching styles. After starting her family, she re-entered the cooking, the food world as a cooking instructor and developed Liz Barber's Creative Feast, uh, which I'm sure she'll share her website with us later and more information on that. Liz is a regular guest on New Hampshire WMUR Cooking Corner and her cooking demonstrations and recipes, as well as her herb gardens, have been featured in various publications, including Where Women Cook, New Hampshire Magazine, the New Hampshire, uh, excuse me, the Nashua Telegraph, and the local uh, paper, the Hippo Press. All of her programs focus on the premise that we are healthier when we cook at home. And we hope you all enjoy today's program. I hope everybody's in. And uh, we had a lot of people coming today, but we will move on. So take it away, Liz. Thank you very much. Uh, Liz, you are uh, muted, hon. Whoop. Thank you. Um, welcome everybody to my home here in Hollis, New Hampshire. This is my studio kitchen and it's a pleasure to have you join me today. Um, I'm very excited. We had well over 700 people register for this class. So hopefully um, a lot of people can make it. We're delighted that you are joining us today um, here uh, for our um, soup class, which is appropriate as I could see from the chat, Many of you are from all across the country experiencing some extreme cold, some uh, snow in areas that aren't normally snowy. Here in New Hampshire, we just got a beautiful blanket of snow uh, covering um, the ground. And that means cross country skiing for me tomorrow um, and all kinds of snow um, activities. But it is a great time to be talking about soups. Um, and so I'm gonna demonstrate two soups uh, for you today. It's going to be a full class of activity because um, uh, while the soups are simple, they have different elements to them. Um, and I love soup not only because um, it is warming to the, to the body, but it also, when you um, make soup with your own stocks, when you use um, good fresh ingredients, you are adding a lot of really worthy nutrients. And at this time of year, it's especially that broth, which is giving you all of the electrolytes um, from the salt that may be in there or all the nutrients from the broth that you may be making yourself. Um, and of course, to have all of that um, wonderful liquid. So anyway, we're gonna get started. I am gonna take you to my website so you can find out where you can get the recipe if you are not doing it today. If you're cooking along with me today, I'm asking that right now you turn your oven on to 400 
degrees because part of our um, uh, uh, demonstration is going to be in the oven and we're going to get something going in there just as soon as I'm done with that. So preheat your oven to 400 degrees. Now let's go over. I'm going to share my screen with you so I can take you to my website to um, thecreativefeast.com. And here you're gonna find all kinds of fun information for those of you who are new to my website. You can check out all of my programs. And if you have a library or an organization that would like a speaker, you can go and share that with them. You can also go to my events calendar to see uh, when I'm doing programs, when I do programs for AARP or um, other organizations, um, that information is there. At the Food and Fun, there's lots for you to see here. Um, obviously, we have our recipe blog, and that will take you right to my recipes. And I do add my recipes as I um, uh, demonstrate them for different classes. But I've made a special page for you, for AARP. So go to this drop down where it says recipe blog and go over here to the right where it says AARP 2024 cook along classes. Here is a listing with recipes for all of the classes uh, for 2024. So you can in advance, if you'd like, check out some of those recipes. But here are the recipes for today for our winter soup comfort in a bowl. We have our so uh, soba noodle soup and our winter tomato soup. So you can just download um, those files and there is um, there are your recipes for you. If you go back to Food and Fun, you'll see um, uh, information. I am an intermittent faster. I love to share my intermittent fasting journey. Lots of information here for you. Check that out. You can also check out my low carb information. That's something that I also uh, believe is a wonderful way to, to live a healthy lifestyle. So there's information there. If you want to check out my chickens, I do have a small chicken coop here. You can see how we designed it and how uh, I built the tunnels um, that my chickens get to run safely through. Many of you are gardeners. Feel free to check out my edible gardens. This is my home here in Hollis. I live in one of the oldest houses in Hollis and I am standing in the original kitchen, um, which um, the interior of the house is all original. And then of course, if you're interested in the kitchen where I'm standing, you can check out and see my kitchen remodel. So that shows you what I did um, almost 20 years ago. So lots of information there and fun pictures for you to look at. Okay, so it is uh, time to get right on to the cooking. So let's get started. Um, I'm gonna move some of my ingredients off of my uh, working spot here. Um, and that will give us the opportunity to get some work done. Now I told you we're gonna start something first. So we're gonna work on the tomato soup first because that requires a step that um, will take place in the oven. So when you're creating a soup and these soups, you know what I love about them? They are fast, but they are full of flavor. So it's those building blocks of flavor that are going to be critical for any soup, but especially for a soup that doesn't take long to make. So the critical building blocks will be um, the vegetables that you may saute first to release all their natural sugars and all of their natural flavors in them. Your stock, whether it's a vegetable stock, a chicken stock or a beef stock, if you can make these at home, I highly recommend it because you're gonna get a huge nutrient value to that. And also you can then season your stock to help build flavor. If you would like, I'm just gonna share one more time, uh, share my website. And I wanna show you here under, on the recipe blog, if you go over to the search bar, you could certainly put in chicken stock and that will come up, but you can also search down on the side here on the right-hand side. And here um, there is, uh, let's see if I have it, soups and stews. And then this is a whole section of different soups and stews that you can find, including my favorite homemade chicken stock. So do take a look down there. That's another place where you can find um, information and great recipes. But those building blocks are going to be critical. So we have our first starting vegetables. Then we have our base, whether it's a broth of 
vegetable broth, chicken broth, etc. And then there are some tricks that you can do to some of your ingredients that will then boost their flavor, intensify their flavor. Now I could make this soup and roast my vegetables. So what do I have here? I have my onion and my celery. I could put those in the oven with my garlic and I could put a little olive oil in there and I could actually roast those. Roasting your vegetables will intensify and caramelize the sugars. So that's one way to do it. We are going to take an aspect of that and we are actually going to take our whole plum tomatoes and we're gonna roast them. They're gonna give them that charred um, exterior. So let me just grab my um, tongs and then I'm going to grab, let me see. Oh, I have a cutting board here because I don't wanna make my, uh, my cutting board too messy during the class. And the first thing we're going to do is we are going to take out our plum tomatoes. We're using a full 28 ounce jar and we're going to slice those in half. You wanna reserve those juices because they're gonna be a really important part of your soup, okay? Now, if you don't wanna use plum tomatoes, say you wanna use fresh tomatoes, you could do that too. You could purchase fresh plum tomatoes, cut them in half, just like this, and you could use those in the place of these canned plum tomatoes. You could also use, um, you know, about a pound and a half to two pounds of um, cherry tomatoes, and that would be um, a wonderful um, roasted tomato that you can add to it. So I'm just going to cut these in half. Now, cutting them in half is going to do a couple of things. First of all, it's going to, by cutting them in half, I'm essentially reducing the cooking time by half, all right? So the smaller you cut your vegetables or your ingredients, the faster they will cook. So these will cook in uh, half the time as if I left them whole. If you prefer not to do this, that's fine. Just give yourself that extra time in the oven. Now, we have our, let me just push this off to the side. We have our baking pan. And I'm gonna take a little bit of extra virgin olive oil and we're gonna put these right onto our baking pan. You might wanna put a little bit of olive oil right on here to help keep them from sticking. And then we're gonna plop them right on there. And then we're gonna pop them into our 400 degree oven and let them roast. And that's gonna happen while we're getting the rest of our soup ready. This particular soup, we wanna cook uh, on the stove top for about 40 minutes. So I'm building in that time. Um, now back to our flavor building ideas. Okay, so roasting your tomatoes, roasting part of your ingredients is a great idea. Another way to boost flavor is to be adding plenty of fresh herbs or spices. In this case, for those of you who have had a chance to read ahead, you will have noticed that I'm actually adding a little bit of curry powder here. I love what that does for the base flavor of this, this soup. It gives it a warm um, uh, spice to it. It's got, of course, we have curry in there, which has turmeric in there, a little bit of ginger in the curry. So it's a really nice addition, but it doesn't, won't end up tasting like a curry dish. So have no fear. Um, and of course, if you don't want curry in your soup, don't put it in. You could substitute with uh, chopped rosemary. You could put in basil if you prefer. Um, this is where you can take the soup and make any kind of a little adjustment that you'd like. Now I'm gonna save these tomato, uh, this tomato juice here because that's gonna go in my stock. This, these tomatoes are gonna go right into the oven. Oh, I'm gonna drizzle with a little bit more of my olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, into the oven they go, okay? And I'm looking to get a nice browning on them. So we're gonna go ahead and I'm gonna set them for about 15 minutes and that will remind me to go ahead and take a look. Ladies, do we have any questions before I move on? Not at this time, Liz. Okay, great. All right. So we have that all set. Now, we're going to get the rest of our vegetables ready. You know, no matter how much counter space I have in my kitchen, it's never enough when you're teaching a class. 
Um, okay, so let's pull out our um, other ingredients. So these are our mirepoix or our base vegetables that are gonna help to add that flavor. So as you notice in this recipe, we have um, celery, onions, and garlic. Um, if you are somebody who loves carrots, you can add them, but I find carrots do add a lot of sugar to a recipe, um, especially when you're making soups. So um, carrots are not always, for me, my favorite. In this soup, I want it to be more savory. Um, the tomatoes will have natural sweetness to them. So I've just eliminated the carrots in this. If you prefer to add carrots, you can, but I caution you just to use one small carrot um, and that would be plenty to build that base flavor. All right, so let's go ahead and get these ready. I've got my onion here. Notice that I cut it in half from top to bottom. I'm gonna show you a really easy way to dice your onion. And then I go ahead and I peel off the outer peel of our onion, okay? and. I love this technique because it's a really um, basic technique for cutting onions and it gets your onions diced small. Um, and then you could also, you know, if you wanted a chunkier um, soup, you could cut them a little bit larger. I'm gonna puree this soup partially. Um, that um, ending of the soup will be entirely up to you. Some people like a real chunky soup. They don't want a puree soup. so. You do not have to puree the soup. I just wanna keep, let you uh, keep that in mind. All right, then I'm gonna cut off the stem end of my onion, all right? And then I'm going to dice my onion. Let me just see if I can grab myself a couple of bowls here to put them in. And I'm going to dice them. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our onion, we leave the root intact, and I'm gonna take my knife and I slice down the root without cutting through. All right, and this is going to give me thin slices of onion for a smaller onion dice. All right, so I've cut down to the root and now I'm gonna turn my oven onion and I'm gonna cut across and I have my diced onion. Now, depending on how quickly you want this to cook, the smaller you dice your onion, the faster it's going to cook, right? All right, we'll do the other side. Now, you could also purchase onions that are pre-chopped and in your freezer section at the grocery store. That's entirely up to you. I love those kinds of um, extra helpers in the kitchen because sometimes you know, some of us are just not, we don't enjoy this aspect of it, right? But it doesn't mean that you can't make a homemade soup if you don't want to chop your vegetables like that. Look in your freezer section buy a good quality chopped onion and it's all set for you to go. You can also buy chopped onion in the grocery section of, uh, in the, in the, I'm sorry, in the produce section of your grocery store. A lot of stores are doing that. All right, so we have our onion diced. I'm gonna go ahead and come over to my stove and I'm going to begin to warm up my pan. Now I do um, caution you, we, we wanna go over a moderate heat. We don't want too high a heat because we don't wanna burn our onion. Now here's something I wanna show you. I'm going to take some olive oil and I'm going to put a little bit of olive oil, about two tablespoons into the bottom of our pan, okay? And I'm going to warm that up along with my onion. That way, I'm raising the heat of the pan while it's beginning to cook and soften my onion. If I were to get my pan too hot and put my onion in, you get that sizzle. And the first thing that's gonna happen is that onion, the sugar in that onion is going to start to burn. So it's a great practice to start with a cold pan, cold oil, cold onion. I'm also going to cut up my celery. Now here, I'm gonna cut it in half just to help, you know, cutting a smaller piece of celery is a lot easier than a long piece of celery, right? So I'm just going to slice that into little sticks. 
hold them together. So it's just like the onion, you cut it in one direction and then you take your knife and you cross cut, okay? Into a small dice, your celery. So Very Liz, simple. While, while you're chopping, we had a couple questions. Okay. Someone asked, can you use um, crushed tomatoes instead of um, doing the tomatoes like you're doing them? Yes, as I mentioned before, what I would do is I would buy uh, Roma tomatoes, fresh tomatoes. You want those tomatoes because they're going to have more um, flesh to them, so you'll get a meatier finish. If you buy a regular slicing tomato, it's gonna have a lot more water to it. So we wanna get that nice meaty tomato. So yes, you can do that. And before I answer the next question, I just wanna let you know, you see how I have all of these inside um, uh, pieces of the celery. Look at this wonderful um, celery leaf. I don't ever wanna leave that behind. So I'm gonna add a little bit of that. That will add the wonderful flavor. Okay, go right ahead. Let's get back to your question. And the other one was, you know, one of those like vegetable choppers that you can use to chop onions. Is that a, is that a good idea? And if so, do you recommend one? Um, I, I think, okay, if you were my student, I'd have you do this all by hand because I want you to be better at it. But I, like I said, I get it that people don't want to do that. So you should use what tool you feel more comfortable with. You could use, I don't have a vegetable chopper that I use, um, although I have um, seen vegetable shredders, you know, like, um, well, I can't think of the name. Anyway, you could use um, anything like that. Just remember, you want your vegetables to be all the same size so they cook in the same amount of time. Okay, so that's why I tried to make my um, celery and my onion pieces the same size so that they'll cook in the same amount of time. Okay, were there any other questions? No, not yet. Okay, wonderful. Well, I'm glad that we got those. Now I've just mashed my garlic here and I'm peeling it right off. So that's a nice uh, quick little tip for you um, just to get that garlic peel off is give it a nice mash. And then you can um, chop your garlic. Oh, I got some of that skin stuck to me. Or um, you could slice it if you have a garlic slicer, which I love. Um, this is a garlic rocker. This is um, a little tool that I really like and that will help me to get a nice fine mince on my garlic. So I'm gonna be doing that. Let me just go back to our vegetables here. And I'm just gonna turn them a little bit. So you see what I don't want to do is brown them. So that's why it's important that your heat remain uh, moderately low. Okay. And then um, what you can do to heat up the process of cooking your vegetables is you could put the lid on the pan, which I will do. And that essentially um, allows your vegetables to steam which will soften the vegetables and then they release their natural sugars and their flavors. So the goal right now of this part of creating our soup is to soften the cells of our vegetables so that they um, release all their natural sugars and those will be a wonderful part and flavor of your soup. Now I've just smashed my garlic here, make sure I get all of that. And then we're going to add that to our pan. Again, a moderate flame. We don't want to burn anything. We just want to keep these sauteing gently. Okay. Now, again, you can put a cover on this, a lid on this, and that will help to cook those vegetables up just a little bit faster. All right. Now, let me grab the rest of my ingredients so we can talk a little bit about these. So while those are sauteing, once they're done sauteing, we're going to add in our curry, okay? When you're working with a spice, a dried spice, in order to draw out the flavors to um, 
you know, we need to reconstitute it. We need to add fat to it and we need to cook it with a little bit of that fat. So I've got my oil in there. I'm gonna add my um, curry powder to the pan as soon as those vegetables have softened. And then we're going to um, let the curry flavor bloom by adding it to the dry ingredients. Now, if you've decided you don't want to use curry, but you're going to use rosemary, for example, or a dried herb, you want to do the same thing with that dried herb, okay? Um, and I also have a little bit of fresh red pepper. I find it really lifts the flavor of a dish. I really like it, especially in a tomato-based soup. So I prefer to add just about a quarter teaspoon. Um, but again, if that's something you don't want to do, you can completely leave it out. I love the versatility of a soup like this where you can change the flavor depending on the spice or the herb that you add. And you can certainly have total control over the heat that you're um, adding in there, okay? So let's take these over to the stove. And I've got my, these have softened beautifully. I can smell them. I can smell the garlic. I can smell the onion. What we're looking is for the onion to be translucent. And what that means is, you know, you it's no longer bright white, but it's this dulled down, almost grayish color. That means that you've softened the cells of the onion and the natural sugars are releasing, okay? And now in goes our curry and our crushed red pepper. And I'm just gonna let that sit there, boy. I can smell that curry. It smells wonderful. Now, uh, ladies, do we have any other questions before I go on? I'm just taking a quick glance over at the recipe. And if you have any questions, please let me know. So when we asked about the crushed tomatoes, she wanted to know if you could use a can of crushed tomatoes. Oh, okay. Yes. But of course, and I'm, uh, I take that back. You can use cut, crushed tomatoes, but you're just going to go ahead and add them in. You're not gonna bother with the roasting of the tomatoes, obviously. Um, so could you use crushed tomatoes instead of the plum tomatoes? Of course you can. You're then um, eliminating the need to roast them and then um, you won't need to puree as much. But I always caution people to really use a good quality because then you're gonna get a good flavor out of it. Um, but could you do that? Yes, you can. You know, again, uh, if you're saying right now, Liz, I re this sounds really good. I'm going to my pantry. Oh, I don't have plum tomatoes. All I have are crushed tomatoes. Well, bring them on out and let's put them in the soup in with the stock. Make sure you build the flavor first with our vegetables and then you can add that in. And because you've got, you've built the flavor with your vegetables first, you've added your curry or your rosemary or whatever herb you're going to use, you've started to build that flavor. And then of course, when it comes time to adding your stock, you're gonna have some really great flavor from that as well. So I hope that answered your question. All right, now I'm gonna go ahead. Um, so 20 minutes, so we've got a few more minutes on those plum tomatoes but I'm gonna go ahead and add um, the rest of our ingredients and get this soup up to a simmer. And then we'll add in our tomatoes once they come out of the oven and we're gonna be really um, uh, all set to go. So now I have a 28 ounce can of diced tomatoes. I like these cause they're gonna add a little bit more texture. But again, if you don't have those, um, and you just have the crushed tomatoes, you can use those. Um, but I'm going to use half of this and pop this in here. Now, this is smelling delicious. And I'm gonna go ahead and take about half of this can. And then the rest I'm going to use for tomato sauce. I have some vegetables that I cooked up for dinner the other night, and I have a few of those left over. Uh, I'm also gonna add the remainder of the juice from our roasted tomatoes, all right? Now my timer has gone off, so let me take out my tomatoes and see how they are roasting. Okay, now they're um, 
They've got some nice heat coming off of them. They've softened up beautifully. They haven't yet browned on the outside of the tomato, but notice the browning here on the pan. When the time comes, I'm gonna put these in for five more minutes. When the time comes to pull those out, I'm gonna make sure that I get the liquid on there to remove that wonderful roasted um, uh, juices on the side. Okay, in goes the remainder of that pan. We don't ever want anything to go to waste. And then we have our chicken stock. So this is a chicken stock that I made myself um, using the recipe that I have on the website. And then I freeze my chicken stock in my um, mason jars so they're all set to go. And I always know exactly how much I have. There is nothing better than during the winter to be able to pull out a container from your freezer that has your frozen homemade chicken stock or vegetable stock or beef stock in it. And my the other thing I love to do, I take these to my kids whenever I go visit them so that they have mom's chicken broth in the freezer because if they get sick, they just want mom. And then they want mom, you know, homemade um, broth and they can just take it out and heat it up and drink a cup of it and it always makes them feel good. So get in the habit of keeping extra chicken stock or vegetable stock in your freezer and you're all set to go. A soup is very close by. Okay, now I'm going to raise up the temperature on my soup, okay? You're gonna raise it up um, so that the soup comes to a boil, okay? And that quick boil, well then, once you get it that up to that heat, then you're gonna drop it down to a simmer, and then we're gonna let that soup simmer for the rest of the class. Now you see my remaining ingredients that I have here is my shrimp, okay? And I buy, um, these are actually shrimp pieces, they're raw, raw peeled, deveined, really inexpensive to buy these shrimp pieces. This was $6.99 a pound versus $12.99 a pound at the grocery store. So a huge savings. But those I thawed out, they even have some of the shrimp juice in there. I'm gonna add this. You don't have to add shrimp if you don't want to. You could add chicken, you know, already cooked chicken if you want. You could do cooked um, hamburger. You could have, you know, you don't have to add shrimp or seafood if you don't want to, but I love how that goes in but we're gonna wait until the soup is pureed and then we're gonna finish it. It only takes about three minutes at a simmer to cook up the shrimp. The other final thing that I'm gonna be adding in is my uh, sun-dried tomatoes. So we have um, our whole tomatoes that we are roasting. We have our diced tomatoes that we put in and I'm using sun-dried tomatoes. And I love this little um, tube of sun-dried tomato paste. I don't use a lot of sun-dried tomatoes and sun-dried tomatoes are generally very strong in flavor. Um, so I will add these at the end with the shrimp so that that flavor stays on top, but also using a, uh, the tube like this, it will last for a much longer in the refrigerator. And then I can just use little bits if I wanna make a tomato cream cheese or tomato mayonnaise, you know, sun-dried tomato mayonnaise, I can use a little bit of that. So. I love these tubes of sun-dried tomatoes. So I'm gonna just put this over by the stove for when it comes time to adding those in. Okay, and ladies, did we have any other questions while um, all of this was going on? Of course we do, because we always have oh, people okay. who want to know. So I love the questions. One question was, exactly what type of curry are you using? Because there's all different types of curries. Yes, thank you for asking that question. So I am using a dried madras curry. This is the typical curry that you buy at the grocery store. It has a little bit of a sweet flavor to it, and it is not a hot curry. If you want a hot curry, then we're talking more about the Thai curries, and oftentimes those are sold in little cans. They are uh, more of a paste. Um, I haven't prepared this soup with that, but I would say go ahead and try if that's what you like. Just make sure that you're getting the right level of heat. Generally, I think it's yellow is the mild. Uh, then, then I think it's 
red, and then green. But you can always ask at your Asian market, um, the heat level. So, um, but I have found that the, the grocery store standard curry that you're buying is a madras curry, which is on the milder side. The other thing I would say about your grocery store curry is it's much more expensive to buy these ingredients at the grocery store. Go to your Asian market. That's where you're going to find good prices. All right. I'm going to take out, I'm just taking out my uh, tomatoes and I'm going to add them in. So go ahead and ask me another question. Okay. They, we're looking at the garlic rocker. Is it, how is it different from a press and do you prefer one over the other? Yeah, I like the garlic rocker because I don't have to stick my finger into the garlic press to try to clean it out. So I, I just like the rocker. Once I discovered it, I thought, oh, this is so much more, I like it better than the press. So that's a personal preference. And you can buy them anywhere on Amazon. Just do a search for garlic rocker. Um, obviously get a metal one, getting a plastic one, you're putting a lot of weight on it and you could easily break it. I'm gonna pop this into our soup. Okay, go ahead, I'm still listening. So what constitutes a good brand of canned tomatoes? Well, um, that's a really good question. Um, I think a lot of it is gonna come from your own experience with canned tomatoes. What do you prefer? Um, I picked up on sale the Muir um, Glen, which I believe is an organic. Um, San, uh, let me see, where is my can here? This has the San um, Marzano, I'm sorry, this is Chuchurosio. So the San Marzano is, you know, the well-known tomato. Um, but in the end, I mean, I have purchased my own market basket is the grocery store here um, that they have a lot of private label. Um, I, I found that their tomatoes are, are um, fine. Um, the sauce that comes in that tomato can make may, may make the difference for you. So it's a lot of personal choice on that. Okay. okay. I'm do, I'm still listening. Yep. How do you how do you freeze your homemade chicken stock? And especially since you said you did it in the jar. How do I freeze it? Well, I make my chicken stock, I put it into the jars, um, leaving an inch of space in the jar. I'm just moving my um my soup around on the stove. Um and then um, I just cover it with the lid and and let it come to room temperature. Never put a hot or a warm liquid into your freezer um, because that will then uh, reduce the temperature in your freezer. So you don't want to do that. And um, and that's pretty much it. Just put the lid on and pop it in the freezer. Two more quick questions. At least that's all I have so far. Is okay. That you use fresh or dried? I missed that first part. The what? Rosemary, fresh or dried? Oh, um, I always use fresh. If you're going to use dry, so fresh for this soup, I would probably use about two table two teaspoons to one tablespoon. If you're using dry, you want to use about half of that. Um, but make sure that you do put it in. Um, to the pan to heat with your onions and your celery first, um, because that will um, uh, rejuvenate it, give some oil and soften it up and release, release those, um, the oils from the rosemary. Now, just before I take another question, um, we're going to make croutons for this. So I have my own, um, I've been making sourdough bread, so I have my own bread here, um, but you can use any artisan bread you want. And we're going to cut these into cubes. I've got my cast iron pan on the stove heating up. And I'm going to show you a really quick way to make really flavorful uh, croutons. So hit me with some more questions. Last one so far is what size stock pot are you using? Oh, good question. So I, for this soup that I um, just made, I believe that is a... Hmm. It's at an eight quart um, La Crescette for the orange pot. Um, and I'm going to be making 
um, when we make the Asian soup, I'm going to make it in an eight quart pot. Now, the thing to remember about um, what size soup pot you use, again, and this is a good uh, tip to remember for um, cooking anything that you may want to speed up the cooking time. The larger the cooking surface, the faster your ingredients will heat up. So if I made, say I made this um, soup in a small pot like this, it's gonna take a lot of time to heat up those ingredients because it's a small surface area. Um, also, you'll over, you know, fill it. Um, so you wanna be cautious, okay? Now, I've got my cast iron pan heated up, okay? I'm adding extra virgin olive oil to it. I'm gonna take my breadcrumbs, toss them in there, I'm just turning on my face just to get a little bit of motion here. And toss the bread to coat with the olive oil. And then add a little bit of kosher salt. Okay, and I'm going to add a little bit more oil. And we're just going to let those brown up. They're gonna have a little bit of salt on them. They're gonna be perfect. The other thing you could do, and why don't we do that just to make this safe for us so that I don't overdo it as I get distracted. We can put this pan into our heated oven. So I'm gonna do that. And I want you to always learn from my mistakes, set your timer, don't, think that you're going to remember because you often forget. So I got my timer set for about five minutes. I also have my over here um, off to the side. My tomato soup is simmering now, now for 40 minutes. Okay, so we're going to let that go. Um, I'm also getting ready to get us started with our Asian soup. So I just put a pan of water on there because we're going to be cooking our soba noodles. So I want to get that water up to um, a simmer and we'll put a little lid on that and let that come to the simmer. This is the pot that I'm going to be using. So I'm going to put that back on the stove, hang out there. Let's pull our ingredients out. Before I move on to this soup, are there any questions for the tomato soup? Just so you know, what's still left to do for that tomato soup is we're going to simmer it for 40 minutes. We're toasting our croutons. I'm going to be adding, once um, the soup is done, I'm going to be pureeing it. Then I'm going to add our sun-dried tomatoes and our raw shrimp just to finish cooking in the soup. And then we're going to serve it. Okay, so that's what's left to do in that one. I'm ready to take any questions you may have. Hey, they said, how long can you freeze chicken stock for? Yeah. Here's my smarty pants answer until you're ready to use it. I know that it, they may say, you know, only freeze for three months, but I've taken my chicken stock out. If I've frozen it well, and it hasn't gotten to, you know, freezer burn on it. I've taken it out after six months. So um, I think, you know, a lot of this is really going to be up to you um, and the way you freeze it. You want to make sure that there's less air in the container. The more air in, there is in the container, the more likely it is that you'll get freezer burn. So here's a little trick. When I make chicken stock, I like to leave the fat on the chicken. So when the stock is done and I'm pouring it into my jars, I will actually put the chicken fat on the top and that creates a barrier to keep the air out and it keeps the chicken stock uh, free from freezer burn. So that's a little tip, okay? All right, what other questions? Oh. I'm ready. Did you have another question? Oh, I did. I thought I unmuted myself. I'm sorry. Sorry. So That's they were okay. talking. 
they were talking about the croutons. Like what what was the type of oil that you use for cooking the croutons? And someone else asked, can you actually cook them on a cookie sheet instead of um, cooking them? Yep, uh, we lost you again, just so you know, you muted. Um, but yes, you can do these on a cookie sheet. You can do them. Um, uh, I would drizzle them with extra virgin olive oil, put the salt on, pop them into the oven, and that would be just fine. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then they said, how much curry powder did you use? I used a tablespoon, but you can adjust that um, however you would like. And so can you, you use... Oh. I'm listening. All right. Sorry. And someone wanted to know if you could use chicken bone broth instead of chicken stock um yeah but here's that weird thing what's chicken stock what's chicken broth i always make my chicken stock broth whatever with chicken bones always because you're going to get a lot more nutrients out of those bones so that's how i make my stock all right, and can you use a stainless steel fry pan instead of a cast iron pan? Yep, as long as it can, you know, depending if you're gonna pop it in the oven, you wanna make sure it can go into the oven. So yes, you can. Okay, all right, That's, we're gonna, yep. Oh, you did you have I another was question? Say, I was gonna say. I, you've muted again. Nope, oh, that's all the questions I have for right now. Okay, great, okay. so. What I'm gonna do right now is we're going to, this soba noodle soup is so fast and easy, but I like to have a protein in it. So for today, I've selected to make these Korean meatballs. Do you have, have to make these? No, you could, if you wanted to, cut up some firm tofu and you could simmer that in your soup. If you wanted to, say you've got the shrimp for the tomato soup and you think, oh, that would be really nice in that Korean noodle soup. Go right ahead, use the shrimp in this. It's just gonna take three minutes to simmer in with the rest of the soup ingredients. And then you've got a shrimp soba noodle soup. So I'm just through, I just decided to throw in my love of this Korean meatball. So that's why I'm doing this. Now, the first thing we wanna do is we've got a pound of uh, hamburger meat, um, ground, um, ground beef. And you could use, if you wanted to, you could use lamb, you could use pork, you could use chicken, whatever you wanted. Um, so we've got a, um, we've got our, our um, garlic. Oops. Okay, let me just take out my croutons. Remember I told you, always set your timer and then you have, you know exactly how long and they won't overcook. And then here are my croutons beautifully dried. So this is perfect. I'm just going to set this to the side and then they will be ready um, for us. So we'll set that over there. Now I'm going to chop up our ginger for this. This is for, again, our, um, oops, this is for our Korean meatballs. These are the aromatics that are going to go into the meatballs to help give them this wonderful, rich, um, Asian flavor. All right. Now, I love this ingredients, the ingredients in this, this dish, because they are simple ingredients, Asian ingredients that most of us can have in our home for, for quite a while and use them in various different recipes. They're very common Asian ingredients. So the spices and things that we're using, the aromatics are common. So you've got garlic, We've got, whoops, a little bit more. We've got ginger. Now I'm using a fresh ginger root. Um, this calls for a one inch piece. So I'm gonna, huh, that's a little bit more probably, but I don't care, I love ginger. So I'm gonna cut that in half. Now, what I'm going to do is you can take your spoon and you can peel off the skin if you like. Or if it's a really thin skin, sometimes I just leave it. I don't worry about it. But the ginger root, you want to use fresh. You do not want to use dry. You're not going to get the same kind of flavor um, as with the fresh. Um, so when we cook 
uh, with ginger, we always want to use fresh. You can buy um, ginger that is chopped and frozen. Just look at the ingredients because it will have some kind of preservative in it. The other thing you can do is when you are buying your ginger, um, I like to buy it in a larger piece and then I'll cut it into one inch pieces and then I will freeze them. And then when I need ginger, I can go to my freezer and pull my ginger right out of the freezer, thaw it out, and it's really actually much simpler to chop. Now I'm only partially chopping this because this is going to go into my food chop food processor. You do want to slice, when you slice your ginger, you're going to slice it with the grain. Um, it's much easier because ginger has um, fibers that grow, you know, they go this way. So when you're slicing your ginger, you want to make sure you slice the same way because they're very fibrous. But these are going to go right into our food processor. We're going to add that. We've got scallions already chopped, about a quarter cup of scallions. You can use the green and the white. Don't worry about that. Um, we're going to add some, uh, let me just get all of these ingredients that we're adding in here. We've got our, this is just the meatballs, remember. Um, oh, salt and black pepper, okay. So we've got a teaspoon of each of those. We have in there um, our sesame oil. Okay, now sesame oil should be kept in your refrigerator. Um, it is a seed oil and seed oils, I'm just gonna grab a spatula, seed oils will um, go rancid at room temperature or you know if they're too hot. So I always keep my sesame oil, and this is toasted sesame oil in the refrigerator. Um, so we have that, we have our soy sauce, that's going to go in. And then we have our um, rice vinegar. Okay. If you don't have rice vinegar, you, you can use a little bit of um, uh, red wine vinegar or champagne vinegar would be fine. The rice vinegar is a little bit, it's on the milder side, which is why you will see a lot of Asian recipes. It's almost, it's just a way to lift uh, the ingredients to give them a little bit of uh, lift and flavor. All right, and then we've got our ginger and our garlic and we're gonna go ahead and do a quick, it just chops everything up, makes it nice and easy to add to our hamburger. If you don't wanna use a food processor and you just wanna chop everything by hand, you can do that too. Okay, and I'm going to chop, I might as well just throw my egg in there. That is going to be our binder along with our panko breadcrumbs. Super easy. Okay. All right, there we go. And now we're going to go ahead and drop this in with our hamburger. Those are aromatics. This is going to make our burger delicious. You really want to season every part of the meal that you're having, every element of it. Okay, in goes our breadcrumbs. And we're going to go ahead, I'm just going to dig in with my hands, mix this all together. I've still got my oven on, right? Because we're going to roast these in the oven. And then we're gonna go ahead and get our soup going. Oh, it smells so good. I love a really well flavored meatball, whether it's an Italian meatball or a Korean meatball. Okay. I'm going to move this off to the side. And then we're going to get our, um, let's see, I'm just gonna grab a pan here. And we're going to cook them. Now, one easy way to do this, you could just brush your pan with a little bit of olive oil, or you can take a baking sheet, um, which I love to use. And then we're gonna take a cookie scoop, make this really easy, and scoop our meatballs right onto our 
she can. Now I can warn you right now, I'm looking over at the clock. We are going to go over probably about 10 or 15 minutes, but I know AARP is really good about recording these. So if you have to go, you can, um, they will be sending you the recording. Okay. Now you can actually leave these as they are, or you can go back and roll them if you like. Um, that will just, you want to pack them in nice and tight. I always like to press them in a little bit. And that way they won't fall apart, but they have their um, egg in there and they have the, um, the breadcrumb binding. I'm just going to move these over. And these will only take 10 to 15 minutes in the oven. You can make them any size you want, but I have to say my favorite tool when I'm doing things like this are these cookie scoops. I get them in all different sizes and they really help when I'm doing something like this. Okay, there's the last one. And the sink is getting full. So I'm just going to roll these together just to make sure that we don't have any loose edges here. And then those are gonna go right into our oven. Super easy. And again, as I mentioned, if you didn't wanna to go to this trouble and you have some already cooked chicken or cooked seafood leftovers, this is a great soup for utilizing that. Um, of course, you could just um, cook up some chicken, um, you know, dice that up and um, saute that and then add it to your soup. Okay, there we go. I'm just going to give my hands a quick rinse. And then we'll go ahead, pop these into the oven, set your timer for 15 minutes, and they will be perfect when it comes time to taking our soup out. Of course, if we're running over time, I'll give them a quick check and see how they're doing. Okay, now, these are my soba noodles. I wanted to show you this package. They come in these wonderful little tied um, packages. Um, and so this, this serving is perfect for four to, you know, two to four soup bowls. I have dramatically cut down on the amount of noodles or pasta that I use in dishes. So this is definitely more than enough for myself and my husband, for example. But these are soba noodles, so they are buckwheat based. They are salted, so keep that in mind. And they only take five minutes to cook. So let's go ahead and we're gonna steam them there. We're gonna let them go for about five minutes, all right? And then we're gonna get the rest of our ingredients ready. Do we have any questions while, um, we have a few minutes. Oh, I did see that I left out my cilantro from my meatballs. So I'm gonna make sure that I use it in my soup for sure. So that's one ingredient that I see that I left out. But ladies, do we have any other questions? Uh, yes, while I'm we, yes. yes, we do. So okay. someone says that they don't really like the taste of olive oil. So what would you use like grapeseed oil or in place of olive oil? For which? Uh, okay, let's just say for anything, okay? So what we want to, first of all, be cautious of, we want to use low processed oils. Olive oil is a natural oil that comes from the olives and the um, olive pits. When you get down to seed oils, you want to be very careful because they go through a multi-step process in their um, creation. So when you're looking for an oil as a substitute for olive oil, look for cold pressed, low processed oils. So you could use um, coconut oil, might be something you wanna use. Butter, perfect, it's a great fat, depending on what you're using it for. Uh, very easy to substitute in, in many recipes. Um, you could use um, avocado oil if you wanted to. Just look for low processed oils and note 
that seed oils are the most processed oils. So you wanna be very cautious of those. They're highly inflammatory and are quite honestly, our bodies just don't like them, okay? All right, next question. Okay, so someone said um, they can't eat garlic and onions. Um, so what can they use for something in the soup that would give it that same great flavor or a really good flavor? That's a really good good question. Um, and a lot of people, um, you know, they do struggle with flavors like that. So what I would suggest then is that you look at the recipe and find what other flavor ingredients are there. Um, so if we're talking about this Asian recipe that we've used, we have a lot of other great flavors that can um, compensate for that. And using herbs and spices is another way to lift that flavor. Um, you could up the celery if you wanted to. If it calls for onion, use celery instead. If it calls for garlic, um, that's gonna be a little bit more difficult. I don't know how you are with scallions. It's probably uh, a, an, an issue for you because they're all in the same family. So um, boost up your other flavors and that may help you out. Also, do not leave out the salt. Salt lift flavor. You don't have to over salt, but salt will lift the flavor and our bodies need salt. So do cook with your salt. Let me just take a quick second here because I wanna add the rest of my ingredients. Um, and this is a real easy part of the recipe. So once I get this going, I'm just looking for my garlic, I can then come back and answer more of your questions. Hmm, I thought I had more garlic than this. Let me just grab another thing of garlic. Hold on one second. I know I look like I'm crazy. I'm missing an entire, oh, Nope. Yep. All right. So let me just grab my garlic. It's off camera here. And I'm going to go ahead and chop up garlic and ginger. And we're going to add that to this along with, oh, there's my garlic that I was looking for. We've got mushrooms. So here is my chicken broth. I'm going to add my mushrooms in there. I'm going to add, I have um, soy sauce. This is all flavor building. We have our sesame oil. Okay. And I do love my little, my tiny little spatulas. And then the other flavor booster here is oyster sauce. There's really no oysters in it, just so you know. It is a kind of a sweetened soy combination. So that's going in. And then I'm going to chop up my garlic and my ginger. I'm going to add those. And we're going to bring those to a simmer, OK? Meanwhile, again, I'm going to come back to your questions, but my noodles have been cooking for close to five minutes. I don't want to overcook these because they'll start to break apart. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take these off the stove. All right. And I'm going to drain them and run them under cold water to stop their cooking, okay? And then I'm going to, so under cold water, just to stop their cooking. And then I'm gonna put them in a bowl, okay? I'm just setting this aside for a minute and adding just a tiny bit of sesame oil that will just keep these noodles from sticking together as they cool down. And then those will go in the bowl, okay? All right, let's get back to your question. Sorry about that. Oh, that's good. So they had a question about the garlic that you said you froze. Do you peel it before you freeze it? So that was the ginger. Although you make a good point. Can you freeze garlic? Sure you can. Uh, do I bother to peel it? Um, the garlic would probably want to peel, but I don't bother to peel the ginger because the ginger, it'll come right off um, and it'll be nice and soft. I am going to use my garlic press for this. So it, it really is up to you. How much work do you want to do at the end versus the beginning? Um, for me, I always just cut it into a piece, leave the skin on, 
toss it into the freezer and I'm all set to go. Okay, what other questions do you have? Okay, so um, with the um, beef that you used, was it 80, 20, 90, 10? And also, can you substitute turkey for that? And if you substituted turkey for the, in the meatballs, would you change or add any spices? Um, okay, so that was an organic 80-20, and I love that question. Um, so I want to have that 20% fat in there because that's going to add some good healthy fat to your diet um, because it is animal fat and, um, you know, it is, um, it is good for us in moderation, right? So um, plus it's going to add some good flavor to it. So yes, that was 80-20. Um, could you substitute turkey for it? Of course you can. Um, and I think if I remember, it's been a long time since I bought um, ground turkey, but I think that's like a 70 something percentage. I, I can't remember what that is, but um, will it um, change the flavor? Eh, I don't think so. Um, in so far as the intensity, I think you've got plenty of spices in there. Um, so I wouldn't worry about that. How that? Okay. All right. So they wanted to know what size of scoop did you use for the meatballs and the oven temp for the meatballs? Uh, you're going to ask me that question. All right. My temperature, I just left it at 400 degrees from where it was previously. Um, and the cookie scoop size is probably uh, like a one and a half to two ounce, I'm guessing. Um, so it, it's just how big do you want your meatballs? If you want tiny meatballs, use a little scoop. You know, that's, that's, again, the beauty of these recipes is you can adjust that. Now, if they're much smaller meatballs, they're gonna take a little bit less time. So you wanna keep an eye on your oven. Okay. All of this is gonna go on to the burner and we're gonna bring that to a simmer. I decided not to use my eight quart pot. Um, uh, my stove, I have this issue with this one burner and you know how it is, it's too expensive to get it fixed. So I just live with it and I always keep a lighter nearby. See, even chefs make compromise in life, right? So I'm going to bring this to a simmer, let those come to a simmer. If you wanted to saute your garlic and ginger first, you can. I'm just going to it for a nice, easy solution to that soup. Um, now let's go ahead and get our other ingredients ready. Cilantro is a big part of this soup for me. You may hate cilantro and I get it. Cilantro, did you know the love or hate for it is uh, almost like a genetic um, mutation? Like you can't change that. You can tolerate it, but you'll never love it if it tastes like soap or whatever. But what can you substitute for it? Parsley is a great substitute for cilantro. You could just leave it out altogether. Chopped parsley is fine. Um, so whatever works for you, I'm a cilantro fan. I love it very much. I will tell you that cilantro is one herb that I do not bother to remove from the stem because the stem is part of the flavor and it doesn't get bitter in the same way that a parsley stem will. So you'll see, um, you know, when I use parsley in my recipes, I'm always removing the herb from the stem. In this case, I just let the stem be part of it and I think it just adds to the flavor. Um, okay, the other thing we're going to, this is gonna um, go into, um, actually, I'm not gonna put it in the soup. This is gonna go in as part of the garnish. Um, so I love this part of the soup. This is where you serve this soup at the table um, just the soup itself undressed, and then you add all of these wonderful things to it. So I'm going to show you that in just a second. I wanted to chop up the cilantro now. The other thing I wanted to do is the last ingredient that's going to go into that soup is the bok choy. But I went to the grocery store yesterday. They had no bok choy in sight. So Here's a wonderful thing about a soup like this. You could substitute the bok choy. I do have some broccoli in my refrigerator. 
that broccoli, if I cut it up into small florets, I could cook that with my soup and it would be a wonderful substitute for the bok choy. You could take frozen broccoli even and use that in its place. Um, I'm using savoy cabbage. Um, so I'm just going to uh, uh, nap, nap a cabbage. So I'm just gonna chop this up a little bit and I'm gonna add that in there. Um, the bok choy, what I loved about it is the bright color, but this is gonna be just fine. Oh, and guess what? With leftover, I'm gonna make kimchi. So um, that'll be fun for me. The other thing you could add in is um, some snow peas. So I grabbed a few snow peas and I'm gonna add those in. Once that soup comes to a simmer, I'm gonna add this in with some of my snow peas and just let them cook just barely. So let me go over to the soup and let's give it a little stir. And what I'm looking here to do is to have my mushrooms soften up. So depending on how thick they were cut, it could take five to 10 minutes. I did buy already chopped on, um, mushrooms. So it's gonna take um, a little bit longer and that's okay. If you had dry mushrooms, you could use those, just reconstitute them in boiling water, let them sit for 30 minutes. And then those dried mushrooms can go in there with the mushroom water. And that would be delicious too. Okay, folks, so. Any questions? I'm going to pull out our meatballs and take a look. Well, Liz, they want to know, they said soy sauce is a little high in sodium. Um, would you recommend a lower one or is there any substitute you could use that would yep. be lower in sodium? Yep. Look at my meatballs. They're great and they're done. Okay. So what would you use in the place? So yes, you could definitely do low sodium soy sauce. The other thing you could use is Bragg's Aminos. And I'm just gonna grab this out of my refrigerator so you all can take a little peek. Um, these are sold um, where the Bragg's products are, which can over be by the vinegar, or you might see it where the soy sauce is. These aminos are a soy protein seasoning, but they have less sodium than a soy sauce. So you can make that substitute um, if you like. Is that it? No, of course it's not. So cilantro, uh, okay. what, what is the best way to, to store cilantro? Oh, good question. I love that one. So all of my herbs, I store, you want to store them dry. So I'll be honest, um, oftentimes I'll come home from the grocery store and I don't wash them. I wash them as I need them. But if you want to wash them ahead of time, wash them and roll them up in a cotton towel so that they're dry because wet herbs in the refrigerator will go bad faster. So this cilantro, I'm gonna dry and then I'll put it into a Ziploc bag, press out the air, seal it up, and that will last much longer in the refrigerator uh, than if you just left them out. They'll get all wilted if you don't cover them, but definitely, especially for cilantro because it tends to go bad really fast Chances are it's because it has been wet. So you want to dry it as much as possible. Okay. All right. We had um, a question about when you put your mushrooms in, you put them in raw. Could you cook them in a little butter first before you added them into your pot? You're someone I'm going to like very much at my dinner table. You definitely can. You can do that. Um, I'm just letting them um, warm up, uh, you know, soften up in the pot. So you could definitely do that. And yes, I'm a butter fan. So yes, I would do that as well. All right, and one more for right yeah. now. Yeah. Oyster sauce substitute with lots of additives. That's what they ask. Does oyster yeah. sauce substitute have a lot of additives? Yeah, I, you know, uh, I had a feeling someone would be asking that and I did not. Um, research that. So if you don't want to use oyster sauce, I would just um, use maybe a little bit of brown sugar in this. And you could also add um, a little bit of cornstarch um, slurry um, and just see how you like it. Um, I don't, you know, are you going to have that much flavor difference? Well, we have soy sauce in there and sesame oil. 
if that's enough for you, just, just use that. Um, I like these ingredients because I use them for a lot of other things. So I have them anyway. Um, it's a great, um, you know, um, Asian pantry item. Um, but uh, there's always room for you to make adjustments. All right, before we go on with more questions, um, I'm still simmering that soup. I'm going to go ahead and we're going to puree our tomato soup. So I'm using my immersion blender, which is an amazing tool to have. You see how easy that is? And I don't have to get my blender out. You wanna tip your soup pot and then all the solids will fall down to one end. Now this is going to be as pureed as you like. I like to bite into stuff when I eat my soup. So I'm gonna leave it partially pureed, it's up to you. Okay, now we've got that pureed and the last part of this soup comes, we're gonna go back to the stove, all right? And let's take our meatballs off of there. And I'm gonna go ahead and get this to a simmer and in go my frozen thawed raw shrimp. It's only gonna take once to get in there and, and whatever shrimp, liquid came from thawing them out, put that in there because that'll give that wonderful seafood another way to build that flavor. And then finally, I'm gonna add in, remember that sun-dried tomato paste that I got out of the tube? That's gonna go in now because that's gonna add a nice flavor to this on top. And there we go. So we're just gonna bring that up to a simmer just to cook our shrimp. It's that fast, all right, and now, I'm taking the last of my veggies and putting them in with my Asian soup. Okay. Thank you all for sticking with me. I know this went over on time a little bit, so I do appreciate you hanging out so that we can get these soups finished. Let's go ahead and start to get things um, up for service. All right. Boy, I wish my um my dishes fairy would come down and take care of all these dishes. He's up in his office. Maybe he'll come down a little later. Okay, so here are our additions for our Asian soup. And I'm gonna show those to you um, so that we can get those ready. Let me see, I lose that all together. Oh, let's get our noodle bowls. So these are great noodle bowls. Um, I think for me, it was just an excuse to buy a real pretty bowl. So they um, have this hole on the side um, and basically a little lip so you can keep your, um, your chopstick nice and handy. So this one was a real pretty one too. So these are fun to have. Um, do you need these bowls? No. Do you have to eat with chopsticks? No, you're gonna use a spoon anyway, but um, so they're nice to have along. Um, so these are our toppings. So we are going to be using, you serve this with, um, we've got um, basil leaves. Now, if you really wanted to be fancy and more authentic, you could use, sorry, they wilted, wilted with the heat. These are fresh basil, by the way. You could use a Thai basil, but um, I, like the regular basil because then I can use it in so many other recipes, um, you know, in the week or so that I have it in my refrigerator. And we're gonna slice that really thin. This is going to add a nice contrast and flavor in our soup. It's gonna burst that flavor um, forward. So we have a little bit of basil. So this is how I would serve this at the table. We have scallions, we have our sesame seeds, we have our basil. If you like, if you prefer parsley, go ahead. I'm using my cilantro, all right? And then I even like to have these wonderful little, um, uh, huh, bean sprouts, okay? 
Make sure you get the fresh ones though, because they go bad quickly and you want to be able to use them up. So that's why the soup is great because you're going to love serving the soup with those. And then you can serve it with a little bit of sriracha or this wonderful spicy chili crisp um, that a lot of people are promoting. You see this in um, restaurants and um, online. Um, it's a wonderful little crispy topping to add, okay? All right, I'm going to turn off both of our soups. We're gonna go ahead and get ready to do our noodle soup. So let's get that served in a bowl. So however much of the noodles you would like. All right. And this is a good, you know, third of a cup to almost half a cup of noodles. I mean, that's plenty of noodles, okay? You want to make this really healthy, do more of the vegetables, do more of the broth, and less of the noodles, okay? Then we'll bring over our wonderful soup. And we've got a ladle. And in that goes right into our bowl with all of that flavorful broth. We've got our vegetables in there. It's looking quite beautiful. And then we're going to top that with a couple of our Korean meatballs. Oh, this is a full meal, right? The more meatballs you add, the more protein you have, that is gonna be a wonderful meal. And then, as I said, you're gonna add some really fun goodies. So we'll add some of our bean sprouts, I'm going to go for the cilantro. Don't forget the basil because that does make a nice difference. And then scallions. And sesame seed. Oh, this I love. I needed to buy myself a new jar. It's crunchy and it's got a little bit of spice. So just be on the lookout for that. And then uh, some lime and people can just squeeze that lime on. So can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. So Liz, they had a question about um, when you were making a tomato soup, they noticed you cooked it in a non-stainless steel. Is that because of you're worried about the reaction between the tomatoes and the stainless steel? I think you are muted now, Liz. Yeah. How about now? Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so what you're referring to is the reaction with a cast iron pan. Stainless steel pan will not give you that reaction, but a cast iron pan will react uh to the acid in the tomato. So good point. It's just a different pan um, that you would be referring to. Okay. Now, let's get our last soup going. Just gonna rinse this out so it doesn't have that Asian flavor to it. And then into our bowl. Now, let me show you a little tip on serving soup have a little plate with you so that when you take the soup out, you run it across the plate and then it doesn't get the rim of your soup bowl with the soup. Okay, so this has our shrimp in it. Wonderful, oh, isn't that gorgeous? Now, if you wanted to, you could add about a cup of heavy cream to this and make that into a cream soup. Again, the the options are endless for all the delicious things that you can do to, for these soups. Now, on goes our croutons. And let me add one more thing to this. I'm going to pull out basil from my refrigerator because remember I bought all that basil. And now I need to find different ways to use it. Here is the perfect way you could actually cook this with basil in it. I'm gonna go ahead and garnish and that's gonna be perfect. So there we go. 
there are our two soups, two full meals, right? Because we've got our protein, we've got our vegetables. It's a beautiful way to make uh, a meal complete on a cold winter's day. And if you want, you can, you know, we've got our croutons here, but why not serve it with some nice crusty sourdough bread? Don't forget to serve this alongside with your Asian. Let's put this together for a real pretty picture. We've got our Asian soup with all of the goodies. And there we go. So I want to thank you all for joining me. Are there any other questions before we say goodbye for today? Last question was, what was the last spicy item that you added for the Asian soup? Yes. So it is called spicy chili crisp. And um, there's uh, a, a few brands out there. And so they're crunchy chilies in a sauce. And, um, you know, I, I love, um, you know, that texture. I like the heat. So that's a perfect addition for me for my soup. Okay. Any other anyway, questions? I think that's it. But I thank you very much, Liz, for this cook along demonstration. These dishes always look wonderful and I always learn so much. So today's cooking along demonstration is one of the many virtual events offered by AARP. Um, our next uh, class with Liz, cook along demonstration with Liz, is on February 20th at 2 p.m. And Liz will demonstrate Sunday dinner Italian style. Oh, you're going to love it. Yeah. Registration for this cook along demonstration is on the AARP New Hampshire website, which is www.aarp.org slash New Hampshire. Uh, and you can also go on there to learn all of the AARP New Hampshire virtual offerings, including coffee and conversations, gentle yoga, educational seminars, and more cooking demonstrations. And also, if you're interested in volunteering for our community, New Hampshire community teams, please contact us. Thank you very much, Liz, and all the people Thank that you. came today. Um, Thanks, people Liz. had to leave early, but they are going to get uh, the recipes and the recordings. So I think we're all set. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Liz. Have, thank Thanks, you. Everyone. Have a great day. Bye, everybody.